Today we're talking about French Rococo. The word Rococo is seen as a combination of the French word rocal, meaning stone, and collie, meaning shell, due to reliance on these objects as motifs of decoration during this period. The Rococo palette is softer and paler than the rich primary colors and dark tones favored in the Baroque taste. By some, Rococo is considered late Baroque, it has similar characteristics, but is more lighthearted. In general, Rococo is an entirely interior style because the wealthy and aristocratic moved back to Paris from Versailles. Paris was already built up, and so rather than engaging in major architectural additions, they simply renovated the interiors of the existing buildings. In the 18th century, a new social attitude began to arise and this was an attitude of relaxation and pleasure. And this led to a change in the arts as well. Rococo rooms were designed as total works of art with elegant and ornate furniture, small sculptures, ornamental mirrors, and tapestries complementing architecture, reliefs, and wall paintings. There was a softening of ornamental style, furniture was made more conducive to conversation, and greater attention was paid to comfort, and apartments were made smaller. The Rococo was almost solely a style for the court, aristocracy, and the nouveau riches. Three stylistic periods can be identified during this time. The Regent style, which is 1700 to 1730, Louis XV style, which is 1730 to 1765, and a transitional Louis XV to Louis XVI style, which is 1765 to 1775. The transitional style was followed by the classical style of Louis XVI. Duke d'Orleans was an ardent supporter of decorative arts and architecture, and many advances in the arts came from his residence. During the years of Louis XIV, the government tried to control the people and the arts. Once relieved of this domination, interest became centered on amusement. There was much intrigue with common people, country life, and foreign culture. Although there was no in-depth exploration of these things, it was their novelty that was important. Jean Borain is credited with the initiation of the Rococo movement. His lighter style is seen in his grotesques and arabesques. He introduced the chenazerie, which are decorative motifs based on oriental designs, and the fashion for centuries, the use of monkeys as ornaments. Guilds were important in establishing stringent requirements. A law was passed in 1730 making it mandatory that the stamp of the master appear on the furniture as verification of its having come from a specific craftsman. An unparalleled level of perfection and craftsmanship was seen in the Louis XV style. There was a reaction from the people about the extravagance seen in the 18th century. Prompting this were publications of engraved designs, examples set by Madame du Pompadour with her political influence and Madame du Barry with her influence in the arts and both were King Louis XV's mistresses. Also seen were the excavations from antiquity of two classical cities. The excavations of Herculaneum and Pompeii probably created the greatest enthusiasm in the trend toward antiquity. The transition period between the Rococo and the style of Louis XVI was first seen as applying classical ornament to Louis XV forms, and then later in the full Louis XVI style there was a gradual straightening of curved lines, and this became typical of Louis XVI furniture. In the beginning of the 18th century, there were three theories affecting space planning that were important considerations for the architects. Covenants, Byzance, and Commodity. Covenants deals with the functional relationship of the parts of the plan, but it is meant that there should be an agreement among such aspects as the position of rooms in the plan, the size of the space, 
the ornamentation, and general character. Also dictated an arrangement that differentiated between the public and the private rooms. Byzance is the consideration given to the form of the structure as it related to the intended function or purpose. For example, the position of society of the owner should be reflected in the type of residence. And then there's commodity, which is the govern of the full utilization of space. Corridors were used to create an entrance to the bedroom and service area. Other passages and concealed staircases were included to minimize traffic through other rooms. Light and ventilation became a factor in planning. Dining rooms were often identified on plans. Corners of rooms now became rounded to create a more decorative feature. And amenities occasionally included rotating fireplace, baths that sometimes had their own heating units, and baths were now located near bedrooms. Looking at the Regent's period, this was the transitional period. Early on, it was closer to the Louis XIV style, while later it was closer to Louis XV style. The changes that occurred were formality to informality, more relaxed character, from symmetry to asymmetry, from Baroque relief, where the emphasis was on highlight and shadow, to a more shallow relief, from rigid outlines to softer configurations, from geometric rigidity to the freedom of delineation, and from distinct structural lines to a more blurred composition. The focal features included large mirrors used more frequently and also always in the most important rooms, depressed arches for doors and windows, and the use of gold highlighted cross hatching, also known as diaper work, for the cove transition to the ceiling. Looking at Louis XV style, Jean Albert was one of the most important designers of the Louis XV style. The use of ornament exceeded the bounds of panel frames, extending decoration from the cornice up onto the ceiling. Decoration often was highlighted with gold, and the picturesque style was very important to him. Rococo motifs included cartouches and trophies, which are arms and the armor of triumphant military leaders. Asymmetry, delicacy, low relief, and verticality was often seen in this style. Terracotta, wood, and occasionally marble were materials used during this period. Decorative techniques included carved boiserie and fresco or relief design in plaster was typical. The Martin brothers developed a varnish imitating Chinese lacquer called Vernice Martin, which was a green color. These were all seen during both periods. Wall panels during the Regent's period were divided by a strong dado placed low on the wall. The panel above the dado had some of the following. Could be severely defined and later more active contours and freely used palmettes and sea scrolls were used. There was an emphasis on verticality. Most elements extended up to the cornice. Ornamental zones separating the top from bottom and edges was seen. The use of figured medallions in the center of the panel was also common. Mirrors were heavily used and sometimes whole rooms could be lined with them. And the most common finish for wood was paint. For Louis XV, wood paneling, either natural, painted, painted with parcel gilt or gold only in some areas was seen and wood paneling was arranged with tall panels placed above a low dado. It would vary from narrow to wide and with asymmetrical parts. Panels were not always balanced by the mirror image in the next panel. Molding was often thin and of low relief. Some were highly complex, including motifs of C and S scrolls, leafage, shells, vines, ribbons, 
freehand curves, and so on. There was a distinct emphasis on molding details. Asymmetry was widespread, but a balance of the total composition was adhered to, meaning that elements such as doors required a corresponding false door to maintain symmetry. Rococo detailing was often applied to the cove transition to the ceiling. It partially went over the cornice molding up onto the ceiling. Regent's fireplaces were reduced in size, but it was still the focal point of the room. It now incorporated a mantle where a mirror was mounted above. Espanolettes, which are the busts of a female figure, were used for mantles and furniture. The introduction of the S-curve would soften the severity of the molding, and marble was the typical material used for the mantelpiece. Louis XV fireplaces were low and wide. Above the mantel shelf, mirrors were used most frequently. Although there was usually no chimney bust, it was just the wall above the fireplace and marble was also the common material for the mantle. Looking at the Regent ceiling, panel paintings started to replace frescoes. Ceilings were relatively flat and plain compared to the walls. A center stucco ornament like a rosette would be used. The division between the wall and ceiling was blurred. For example, ornament would continue from the moldings onto the ceiling. Mirrors were also used on the ceiling. For Louis XV, a white plaster ceiling was used with a cove transition from wall to ceiling. Sometimes blue sky was represented with birds and cherubs placed in the clouds. Furniture was easier to move because of a lighter scale. It was considered more graceful and informal. Multifunctional pieces were created to meet the demands of the owners. The materials used were wood, lacquer, tortoiseshell, and bronze. Many woods were imported to attain the color and grain that were important to surface design. Bronze mounts were essential to protect the fragile corners, and gilt bronze was important as a decorative application over veneer. Bronze could also be seen in handles, escuchons, which were keyholes, centers of panels, friezes, the terminal of legs, and pendants. French artisans attempted to create the lacquer of the Chinese and Japanese, but never quite attained the brilliance or permanence. Regent seat furniture was a transition from primarily rectilinear forms of the Louis XIV to the curvilinear contours of Louis XV. They tended to have symmetrical features and legs that were slightly curved. Louis XV tended to have asymmetrical decorative detail and legs had a more pronounced curve. Backs were generally lower than of the Louis XIV period and were either fully upholstered or surrounded by a carved wooden frame. And styles were straight or curved and the cresting of the back was serpentine. Upholstery could be changed seasonally. The arm supports were now set back away from the seat edge instead of coming up from the front legs. Manchettes or arm pads were also added. The cabriole, leg, you, the cabriole leg was used in the late Louis XIV chairs, but the curve was slight, whereas in Louis XV the curve was more pronounced. The ending of the legs was either a scroll set on a base or a doe's hoof. A curved stretcher often connected the legs, but later in the period this was removed. A transition of chairs is shown on page 239. For Louis XV, comfort was a big feature. There was an emphasis on informality. Carved wood exposed all the way around the frame was common. Asymmetrical carved detail was seen on the cresting of the back, on the center of the seat rail, and the knee of the cabriole leg. Legs ended in a scroll with no stretcher on the base. Seats were caned or upholstered or even embroidered. Curved arm supports were set back. Arms also had manchettes. Finishes included lacquer, parcel gilt, paint, gilding, and a waxed natural wood. 
two colors was often seen on one piece and these colors would coordinate with the wall paneling. Two types of chairs were common. The fauteuil, which is an open arm chair where the back was a cartouche shaped or a cabriolet, which means it's a concave back that was rarely attached to the seat and the bergere. And the bergere differed from the fauteuil because the arms were enclosed and the seat cushion was separate. Other chairs seen were the marquee seat, which was a very wide and deep chair, and it was said to be a response to women's dresses, which were extremely wide. Multiple seating units were important. Comfort and informality can be seen in the Duchess Brise, which is a chair with a separate footrest. Transitional Louis XV to Louis XVI chairs included sharp distinctions made between the different parts of the chair, for example, between the seat and the legs, whereas before in the Louis XV, one part would flow right into the next. Tables of the Regency included features from the previous styles incorporating new styles as well. They were designed to coordinate with the wall panel that it would sit beneath. Mounted on legs that curved away from the table, the back legs often would curve toward the wall. Legs were connected with the stretcher. In the center would be a carved ornament. Marble tops were often used. Writing tables were important with a surface of tooled leather. Or mulu, which is a gilded bronze and brass, was used on the edges of tops, drawers, and legs. Without a stretcher, these legs were cabriole with a metal cover protecting the feet. The apron of the table would often have three drawers. Espanolettes were seen on the legs. Louis XV had multifunctional tables seen as well as specific functions for gaming and coffee tables. Most features from the Regents were present during this time as well. Regency storage pieces gave the impression of heaviness even with a curved outline. The commode or chest of drawers had three drawers and very short legs, where Louis XV would have only two drawers and a shaped apron and tall slender legs. The shaping of the body was complex with a serpentine outline and the front was smaller than the back. The kind of shaping is called bombay. This type continued through Louis the 16th period when straight lines became prominent. The cabriolet leg was seen and the apron had a downward curve. Louis the 15th had a shaping of the body was the same during the Regent's period except it sat on a taller slender leg and marble was also used for the top. In the transitional period they kept the delicacy of the Louis XV but introduced straight lines. Curves of the cabriole legs tended to be slight. The frieze could have classical ornaments like guilloche, Greek key, or acanthus leaves and contain three drawers. The front might also be divided into three frontal planes. Drop handles replaced the fixed handles of the Louis XV period. Four poster beds were now considered outdated. The leaped hinge had a headboard and a lower footboard with a flat oblong shaped canopy extending slightly over the bed. The leap duchess was similar except that the canopy extended the entire length of the bed. The Lida la Polonaise had a head and footboard of equal height where iron rods were curved and fastened to each corner of the head and footboard. From these, fabric fell from a centrally located dome and would attach to each corner of the bed. And the Lida Turk had larger dimensions and gave the impression of a sofa. It had an arched headboard and footboard of equal height and was placed parallel to the wall. The canopy started at the wall and fell over each end of the bed. Each of these were popular during Louis XV and the 16th and the ornamentation would vary. This concludes 
our topic of French Rococo.